Now we're moving on to uh, the last part of the workshop, and that is uh, a workshop within a workshop on preparing your graduate school uh, applications. Uh, the, really happy uh, to have some materials uh, that uh, both uh, Professor Genevieve, who was uh, part of the faculty panel, uh, and another Professor Danai uh, Kultra uh, have prepared in the past. Uh, uh, and I hope that this is uh, going to be material that is going to be helpful uh, to you uh, as well. Um, as uh, always, you know, please, please feel free to uh, post any uh, questions or comments in the group chat and I will try my best to, uh, to monitor that um, as well. All right. So then uh, let's start. Um, I first want to uh, mention uh, men I first want to mention something and that is uh, that there exist application fee waivers for EGS participants. Uh, but I have to point out that this is for uh, citizens or permanent residents of uh, the United States uh, to be able to check if you are eligible. Uh, for a fee waiver, you can always go to uh, our graduate admissions uh, webpage uh, and there you will find a link uh, called graduate application uh, fee waiver request form. Uh, if you click on that, you will be able to get uh, more information about this. Uh, so, so please do that uh, when you get a chance. Uh, uh, and um, one of the things that you will see there once you click on the form, uh, you, they will ask you what is the reason and one of the reasons that you can list is that you actually participated in Explore Graduate Studies in CSE. All right, so in this last uh, session, uh, we will cover quite a few things, uh, but if at any point uh, you feel like you need a little bit more clarification about any of these steps, uh, please let me know in the chat and I will try to spend some more time on, on those. Uh, in particular, we're going to be talking about the statement of purpose. It's one of the sort of main uh, documents that you will be submitting. Uh, for your application. We're going to talk about personal statement. Uh, we'll touch on recommendation letters as well. And then just some sort of tips um, uh, on uh, do's and do not of uh, what to do after you uh, get your offers from uh, different graduate programs. Uh, so the first uh, thing is the statement of purpose. Um, now uh, here, I just wanna try and point out uh, some of the, the pitfalls that we often see in statements of purpose, uh, but also uh, give you some insights into what makes a statement of purpose uh, uh, strong. Now, one of the things that probably doesn't make it strong is trying to write it all as a, as a poem, uh, as you see in, in this example. Now, if you look at uh, the official admissions website, um, it says something to the extent that the uh, that your statement of purpose should address your academic and research interests. Uh, and I hear I want to say that there's emphasis on academic interest for your MS application, uh, and in particular research for your PhD. Though you can uh, do it for both uh, if you have um, uh, both interests. Um, your past experience. Any past experience is valuable experience, uh, but it is important to mention uh, 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 if you have any uh, past research experience for your uh, PhD uh, applications. And if you don't, uh, that is also something that we can that we can talk about uh, a little bit more um, in this session. Uh, and then, of course, one of the important things is uh, your future career goals. Uh, throughout our panels, one of the, the highlight or one of the things that, that we have uh, seen uh, uh, panelists mention is uh, being able to explain why uh, you actually want to get a PhD or why you want to get your master's. Um, and uh, one of the things to point out here is that the statement of purpose itself is not an autobiography uh, autobiography. Um, it's not uh, where you write about your uh, experiences uh, more broadly. 
uh, oops, sorry. Uh, actually, what it is about, it is about uh, your uh, research and academic uh, interests, goals, uh, and in some ways, accomplishments. But I'll tell you more about the accomplishments later. And the most important thing to note here is that you have specific audience. You're trying to persuade professors sitting on the graduate admissions committee that you should be admitted into, into this program. Right? And the most important thing is to really consider the purpose in applying to the program. Just having aspirations, oh, I really want to have a PhD, is probably not going to be enough. It's probably not a good reason to begin with, just wanting to have some kind of a title or a designation. Um, unless it, your PhD or your master's education helps you accomplish uh, a certain kind of goal, uh, then what is, what is the reason for even uh, getting it? And also raises concerns about, well, would you stick out? Would you stick with it as you are as you're going through this often challenging process? Because graduate school is challenging. What they also want to do is to see, can you do research and have a vision for what you want to contribute? And again, maybe less emphasis on research for master students, but it doesn't hurt if you have those interests as well. And you want to really convince them that you will be successful in the program. The program, of course, needs to make you, uh, enable you, give you opportunities to be successful. But given those opportunities, will you respond to them and will you be able to succeed? Those are the things that most graduate admission committees are looking at and individual faculty as well. Now, this is not a laundry list of your academic accomplishments. You have a, your CV for that, where you will list everything that you've done. This is a story, an essay, an argument that you're writing in support of your own application. Any of your current academic accomplishments are their examples that help support your argument that you're making about why you will be successful in the PhD program. If you have research experience, listing that research experience is there in support of perhaps making a claim that you have the right kind of foundation that prepares you well, or at least gives you some understanding of what it, it means to do research. And of course, other experiences count as well. If you have experience working in the industry, that has already put you in, in a position that, that you can talk about how you face certain challenges and how you were able to overcome them. Even if you don't necessarily have research experience, industry experience, there are other experiences that you have. There are other challenges that you were facing. There are the reasons why you had to work hard to get the kind of opportunities that you have. Calling out those is very, very important. And using some of the accomplishments as examples is what it means to write a strong statement of purpose. So then the question is, well, how do you actually organize your statement then? In particular, I mean statement of purpose. So some of the things that you wanna think about is what research area interests you. Even if you're a master's student, there's some kind of a concentration within computer science and engineering that might interest you. Maybe it's AI, maybe it's hardware. Maybe it's software systems. Maybe it's security within software systems. 
you're coming to your master's program to get broader education in, in, in CSE, but still to specialize in some aspect of it because it is too broad. You already had broad education in, maybe in CSE if you were a CSE undergraduate. Now it's time to pick something that you specialize in. Identifying what that is, is important. It's not necessarily committing you to doing research in that area or specifically taking courses in that area. But it does show that you are able to research these different areas or learn about them and that you have a good understanding of what they are. Then you want to talk about what research, what experience you have. What are the things that you have done? Now, I say it doesn't necessarily have to be research. Research helps if it's specifically for the PhD program. But maybe you worked as a, I don't know, software developer and had to deal with a lot of challenges of, of deploying software in real world situations. That experience counts. And what do you want to do? What research do you want to do? And what in particular do, do you want to learn about? And then also, it's fairly important to say why this particular university that you're applying to. And this is going to be different and tailored for every school. If you're applying to Michigan, it's going to be different from what you write for Stanford or for any other school that you choose to apply to. Because there are some specifics about those schools, those universities, those programs that you want to show that you actually understand and you want to show that, that, that you understand what kind of effect they can have on your education and later on for how they allow you to accomplish the goals that you set out to, to, to accomplish. Getting a master's is not necessarily a goal. Getting a PhD is not necessarily a goal. It is a step towards a goal, getting an academic position, getting a position in the industry, doing a startup, or any other goals that you might have. Now, how do you, how do you get started? Well, you have to start learning about these different concentration areas, about people in those areas so that you can establish that interest. And if you already establish some interest, then start reading papers, for example, academic papers from those areas. Because one of the best ways to actually connect with your audience, faculty on these admission committees, graduate admission committees, is to have an understanding of the areas that you have interest in and the areas perhaps that they contribute. So here are some do's. You want to be concise. Not just that you have a limit, I believe for University of Michigan, the limit might be three pages. For some other universities, it might be even less. You want to be to the point. Graduate admissions committee members have to go through thousands of applications. Maybe not each of them, but as a com committee as a whole, usually gets about 1,000 applications. Help them get to the important information in your statement quickly. They're going to have limited time to scan through your statement, 
make sure that there are things that will catch their eyes. If you're too verbose, it's going to be difficult to do that. Now, one of the ways that you can call out important pieces of information is by using boldface. You have to be careful, though. If everything is important in your statement of purpose, then probably nothing is. Um, so so you, don't, you don't want your statement of purpose to be all in bold. But calling out certain keywords, perhaps certain names of people, can help. You want to tailor your statement. Now, this, is, this, this means many things. I would usually uh, start by telling students, you want to tailor it to yourself. You don't want to necessarily write a statement of purpose that isn't you, that isn't about your interest, that is geared towards getting into some university because you think that's what they want to hear. I would always suggest write them about what you want to tell about your interests, about your accomplishments, about your goals. And even if you don't get into some school that you really wanted to get into based on that statement, then you probably know that you wouldn't be happy there anyways, because they do not, they did not accept you for the statement that describes who you are. Now, it needs to also be tailored for the university, but in a way where you are speaking in, in the language of those people who are reading your statement so they can understand it. And of course, it can be tailored towards specific people in those universities. So you will remember from the previous slide, we said there is always a part of your statement of purpose that is targeted at a specific university. It might be tailored for specific faculty members that you want to work with because most of statements of purpose will ask you for some of these names. Even, even if you are applying for master's program, you, the universities or at least people on the graduate admissions committee, they want to know that you have an understanding of who are the even let's say instructors who will be teaching specific courses that you really want to take but those courses will be related to their research areas so again we're going back to research even for for the master's program under at least understanding of it even if you don't necessarily want to do research and this goes back to naming specific professors. Now, we're going to talk about don't side of naming specific professors. But the do side here is knowing who those professors are. Matching them to the actual interest that they have and not making a completely, make a, a wrong association between a professor and, and a research interest. And just use simple English. The goal isn't really to persuade someone that you know what you're talking about by using some kind of jargon or some kind of complicated language. The goal is to show them that you can explain things in a simple, accessible way. And then of course, proofread it. Proofread it for typos, for grammar errors. Have somebody else read it to make sure that they understand it as well. Not just to make sure that they understand. So they can also perhaps provide some feedback, constructive criticism on your statement. Even if they're not in CSC, all the better, because you might want to get a sense of whether people outside of your immediate 
interest area understand what you're talking about. All right, what about what not to do? Well, you don't want to be too long or too short. And I know that's not really helpful because what does it mean to be too long and what does it mean to be too short? Well, you're lucky about too long because there's usually a page limit. So you really don't want to go over that page limit. In fact, even if, if uh, <clears throat> a university is allowing you to go over two pages, you probably want to keep it down to two pages. You want to stay concise. But what you don't want is to leave way too much uh, blank space. Because you were given space and opportunity to write about your own goals and interests. And, and you simply did not take advantage of, of that opportunity. You could have told the graduate admissions committee so much more about yourself and you didn't do it. That's what too short means in this particular case. You don't want to be too general, too narrow. Again, not really helpful. But what it means is that you don't want to necessarily talk about computer science and engineering broadly and your interest in it. Because even, you know, if you're, you know, master's student just taking courses, let's say, you're still going to take targeted courses. If you're a PhD student, even though we are ex you know, expecting PhD students to, to explore a specific idea in depth, we want them to have some kind of a breadth of knowledge. But again, if you start talking about, I'm interested broadly in CSC, it's not really going to tell much about your specific goals. And it also shows that, that maybe you do not have the awareness that you cannot tackle it all in either your master's or your PhD program. You also don't want to be too narrow. Part of the reason is because you might not know what you actually want to do. I always like to tell a story how few years after I uh, started my PhD program, I went back and I read my own statement of purpose. And I have to say, I, I, I laughed a little bit because it was miles away from what I was actually doing at the time, but it also showed me how much I had to learn. It is fine. You might not know the specifics because if you already figured out what your dissertation should be, if you already done it, then why are you getting a PhD? At the same time, there's some logistics here as well. If you're very, very specific, targeting one and only one specific faculty member, and you're making it appear like no one else can work with you and you would not want to work with anyone else, and it just so happens that that faculty member is not taking students that year. Maybe they took on an administrative role. Maybe they're on, on sabbatical. Maybe they simply don't have the funds to support more students or, or, more, or time. You will simply not be considered for that program because you're too narrow, too narrowly scoped. So be careful about that as well. Now, you definitely don't want spelling and grammar mistakes. So again, goes back to proofreading. You don't want to name the wrong school, department, or professors. I know you're going to be writing a lot of applications, but it is really one of those mistakes that really stands out. So again, proofread. You don't want to start with things like respected sirs. Jenna mentioned that during the, the faculty panel. So you want to be 
you want to understand, you want to be also inclusive and understand the composition of your audience. You don't want to mention everyone on the faculty. That goes back to being too general because you can't work with everyone. And there's no way that your interests include everyone. In many ways, that, that shows that you haven't really explored your interests or you haven't really thought about them. Because as much as there's so many interesting things out there, at the end of the day, we have to pick a subset of it, whether you're a master's student or a PhD student. And you don't want to talk necessarily about high school or childhood. That is not what statement of purpose is for. That goes back to that comment about this not being an autobiography. There are opportunities to talk about some of these things, but statement of purpose is not the place. And you want to check your adjectives because at the end of the day, they do not add much to the statement. Of course, you're passionate. Of course, you're very, very excited. You will be thrilled to be at the best university, enter the name. No matter what university it is, they're going to look at it and say, oh yeah, we, we are the best. And even if they don't think that they're the best at the moment, they probably have in mind, you know, who is standing in the way and, and you know, how one day they will be the best university. Joking aside, you want to persuade your audience with examples not adjectives. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, keep going because we have um, a little bit of time left and still some things to look at. Now, one of the things that we need to look at is the personal statement. It is part of your application. Now, your personal statement should describe how your life experiences affected your decisions to pursue a graduate degree. They're still relevant to your graduate application. But this is the place where you can talk about your life experiences. About the challenges that you face, the ways you try to overcome those challenges. And again, who reads it? Well, members of the graduate admissions committees, mostly faculty, professors. So your audience is the same. Now, this is not about your research experiences. Anything about research experiences belongs to your state in your statement of purpose. Now, here are some examples. Here's an opportunity to talk about the environment that you grew up in. Again, assuming that it affected your decision to go to grad school. You don't want to just keep listing irrelevant things that had no effect on on your decision to, to pursue graduate degree. You may want to call out certain things, such as, for example, being a first generation college student. Those are the kind of challenges or, or the situations, perhaps, that defined your academic path. As I mentioned before, any kinds of difficulties, especially if they reflected on things like your academic record and the ways that you work to, to overcome those. Or the ways that you're working on overcoming them as well. Doesn't have, doesn't have to mean that you always, you know, were, was successfully able to overcome all of your challenges. We all face challenges at all times. It's, it's not necessarily a state where you're done. Anything that is related to, you know, different kinds of activities that you have participated in 
extracurricular, outreach, all of these define who you are and who you will be as a graduate student. I already mentioned outreach activities. And what you're looking for is anything that may distinguish you from, from others. Because again, graduate admissions uh, committee members go through thousands of statements. In some ways, they have to make that decision, why you and why not someone else? Help them explain to them who you are as an individual. Now, realistically speaking, being pragmatic about this, the SOP is more important. And if the members of the Graduate Admissions Committee are already impressed with the SOP, your letters, which are very, very important, your CV, your, your transcripts, and so on, then you know, those members of the committee will pay attention to the personal statement as well. Now, some more than the others, and that's something that we have to acknowledge. I take some effort in reading these personal statements because I, I really think that they define who you are as applicants. But the reality is that an amazing personal statement alone, in most cases, will not get you into graduate school. And an amazing recommendation letter can, for sure. But one thing is for sure, that a really bad personal statement will raise some concerns. And it might change the admission decision for the worse. So again, quickly some do's. You wanna be concise, you wanna use simple English, and you want to proofread it. This is a sample of your Writing style. Some might say true writing style, right? One was the more academic, this is about yourself. So you want feedback on this as well. Now again, being too long or too short is never good. You don't want to make the same mistakes from the, from the SOP. And the challenge here is that too often, applicants leave the personal statement for the last thing. They neglect it. And they put it last minute. And it shows and it hurts their overall application. Um, all right, so here we have um, a question. What about being a victim of larceny and having mental health issues that severely impacted by GPA? That's exactly something that you want to call out in your, in your personal statement. If there's any concern that you have about how members of the, of the Graduate Admissions Committee will perceive your application, your case, or any part of it, the personal statement is a place where you can address that. All right, recommendation letters. Now, recommendation letters are also exceptionally important. And it's also important who you ask. And this is, this is a challenging part. This is something that we as departments have to reflect on. And I'll tell you why. But I first wanna tell you who are traditionally good uh, uh, recommendation uh, uh, letter writers. Faculty usually with PhD, whom you've worked on research. Now, again, this is specific to, to CSC programs. Faculty who know who you are, who can give specific information about you beyond what we can already see in your transcripts or, or your CV. Maybe there's, there's a specific class project where you, uh, you know, where, where the, the faculty noticed you. Maybe you were a TA for one of the courses. It's important to give them an opportunity to, or some, something to write about you. And maybe they're your industry mentor, preferably with a PhD that always helps because then they have understanding of uh, how you would perform or how some of your accomplishments in an internship would translate in, a, in academia. 
but you also don't want to go overboard with number of industry mentors. And this is, this is for PhD, right? And of course, you know, if there's a specific postdoc who really knows you very well that you work with closely, they are also an option. But this, this is kind of uh, in, in order of, of sort of preference in many ways. Now, just asking a faculty that you took a class from, um, it's, it's good, but it's not ideal unless you have taken classes with them uh, you know, a couple of classes, maybe, maybe there's something in particular that distinguished you, giving them some opportunity to write about something. And then finally, uh, faculty or industry mentors without PhD who know you well. Uh, they can still paint a picture about you, but sometimes there's this uh, perception that, that maybe they don't necessarily know what it takes to, to succeed in the academic pro uh, program, a PhD academic program. Okay, now this calls out challenges of asking for recommendation letters because maybe you are at a university that does not uh, uh, put emphasis on research. Maybe your recommendation letter writers do not necessarily understand uh, the, uh, what is important to write in your letter. All of these are challenges that we are also constantly thinking about in trying to see how do we overcome them so that we don't necessarily negatively affect people who are coming from different backgrounds and with different opportunities. And similar thing applies for letters for masters, but um, it's not necessary that you focus on the first four Overall, being able to get any of these recommendation letters is a plus. All right, now we have to keep going. I'm sorry, we're already five minutes over our time for this, this session, but I think this is important. So I will just uh, call this out. So the question here is how can you help your letter writers? Because at the end of the day, you're asking them, you know, could you write me a good recommendation letter. Or in fact, a, a much better way is to say, do you have the time to write me a good recommendation letter? And notice the emphasis on good, because sometimes people will just write you any recommendation letter that is not necessarily good. And if they are not willing to write you a good recommendation letter, you perhaps want to give them an out. And a good out is saying, do you have the time? So they can always say, I'm sorry, I don't have the time, if they don't want to write you a good letter. But if they do want to write you a good letter, how do you help them? Well, you want to prepare things for them in systems that they already use to submit these applications. You want to send them the information that you already have. So it refreshes their mind, but also they know what is it that you have accomplished since they worked with you or since the last time they spoke with you. You want to give them some kind of a write-up, not necessarily, I mean, not a write-up of a letter, more a write-up of what you think is important or that they should remember so they, they can refer back to it. Oh, there's another example. Maybe you want to call out a project that you worked on with them, some of the ideas that you contributed, some of your future goals some of your future goals. Remind them of their strengths and so on. The key here is remind them of certain things. If you took classes with them, remind them what class you took with them, how well you did. What are some of the specific interactions that you had that might give them an opportunity to write about something positive? What have you done in those classes? Were you a TA or not and so on and so on. Maybe you were an active member of a certain group that, was, that had that particular faculty as, as a faculty advisor. Maybe they were specifically your mentor at some point. And again, if you have anything that you need to, that you want to explain, if you're concerned how they will perceive it, this, this contact 
th this, this will be part of the information that you include when you're contacting them. All right. Um, so we have some questions that I just want to uh, come back to very, very quickly. Uh, what is a good average length of a personal history statement? Um, there's obviously uh, page limits. Uh, I have seen statements that are effective that are about a page long, page and a half long. But again, you always have the whole page limit if you, if you need to write more. You definitely don't want to stop at just one paragraph. Um, is there a minimum or maximum number of recommendation letters? Uh, different programs will tell you specifically how many recommendation letters they are accepting. Uh, and whether they will consider more or not. Uh, usually they don't. Um, now, again, please check with the program that you're applying to because it's difficult for me to tell you. Um, what if uh, we TA on a massive course that had the very little one-on-one -on -one interaction with the professors? There were more than 50 members of the course staff. Similar situation uh, as when you are just uh, uh, another student in a large class. Try to remind them what are potentially some of the the things that you have done or, or why you did well as a TA. Um, and maybe they can then refer to some of the other staff members that you worked closely with that can confirm these things or maybe, uh, you know, uh, uh, help uh, with their memory. But again, you're seeking to, uh, to uh, get recommendation letters from faculty that know you in some ways. So you have to weigh whether this, this would be the right faculty or not. Uh, is Interfolio compatible with any uh, or every university? No, it isn't. Uh, and this was, this was more of an example, right? So, so find out what is it that the, the university is using uh, and then try to, try to simplify the process for them. Sometimes faculty might have certain preferences. So I will actually tell students, okay, give me a spreadsheet with all the universities where you're applying and all the dates and I can go through it and, and just make sure as a checklist that, that I'm submitting these letters for you. Uh, and then, of course, you know, send me your SOP, send me your CV, send me, you know, the things that I need. I, I don't usually look at, at transcripts, but, uh, you know, sometimes students really want to call out some of the things. So give them the materials that, that they need and organize it for them. Um, are the recommendation letter program specific or is the general letter the recommender writes for all the programs the student is applying to? It depends. Um, uh, mostly these are general uh, letters uh, that sometimes uh, recommenders will at the very end uh, maybe customize or, or tailor for a specific uh, university. Uh, but most of the time there are, uh, there are more generic because they probably apply broadly um, uh, to all universities because they are about you. They are not about you in the context of a specific university. Um, what should I emphasize if I have not been able to deliver uh, proofs for theorems as an undergraduate, but still interested in pursuing theoretical computer science? Um, this is a very, very specific question where, to the point where I would actually suggest you go and, and contact professors from theory that, that you're really interested in, in working with and try to better understand what is it that they are looking for uh, in this particular case. But there should never be... A, 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 uh, expectation that you have already done everything that you would have, you know, learned in your master's or your PhD. It goes back to some of the earlier comments that I made. Then what's the point of, of uh, going to graduate school if you have already done everything? So usually the requirements are not so strict that to show that you have already done all of these things or that you know how to do them. Um, is it okay to submit a recommendation from other departments other than uh, CSC you worked research with on a co-advised research project? Of course, uh, this, is, this is not just CSC, right? Especially if you have interdisciplinary background, right? Uh, you might only have uh, uh, references from other departments, but it is important that they have some understanding of the, uh, of the graduate um, uh, uh, graduate programs, uh, because then they know how to tailor their recommendation letters for uh, members of, of these graduate admission committees at, um, at the, well, especially if it's research universities. 
Does it help if your recommenders, faculty sponsors, reach out to potential advisors to tell them about yourself? Uh, this, is, this is a personal preference. But um, I think it's also important to show uh, that, or I, I'm going to speak more for myself. I think it's, it is important to, uh, uh, to show some level of independence, uh, that you are able to also reach out. So I would prefer when students reach out to me, and even if they just mention who they are working with uh, and where the connection is coming from and you know, why they heard about my work. Maybe they heard about my work from their, their advisor. But I would still appreciate uh, that kind of, um, um, uh, what's the right word here, uh, initiative from the, from the student rather than, than being uh, just recommended by, by someone else. Um, all right, so I think, I think we cover most of those questions. And here I will just, uh, let me see if there's anything else. Oh, one, one last thing after you get off first and then we will, we will stop. Uh, with this um, uh, session. Uh, so when you get an offer, uh, this, is, this is important in many ways. Uh, acknowledge that you received it. Uh, and uh, I mean, you don't have to say that you're excited about it if you're not, that is perfectly fine. But uh, you know, at the very uh, least, you know, let us know if, if you are excited, let us know that you are excited. And this is not just Michigan, this is, this is any program. Uh, it goes a long way to establish those kinds of relationships, even if you're not going to go to that university. Maybe you will years later, you know, come back uh, as, a, as a, you know, uh, potential faculty, as a, you know, job applicant. Who knows? Use these opportunities to establish good relationships with uh, potentially your colleagues, uh, career colleagues. Respond to emails from potential mentors, uh, and uh, of course, talk to their students. Uh, that is that is always a good thing to learn um, and understand. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. I mean, that is always a good uh, way to establish those kinds of relationships, uh, and it's important because you know uh, faculty are usually recruiting small number of students, right? They they specifically. Uh, you know, thought about you as um, as an applicant, and and it's important um, to to respond to them if, if, especially if they are the ones reaching out to you uh, with an offer. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that, um, but it's very important to note that not responding at all uh, inevitably is going to be perceived as a lack of interest on on your part, right? Uh, it's not like, oh, one of the hundred students didn't respond back. It's, it's one student that I made an offer to, you know, this year or that I wanted to, to join my research lab this year. And this is, again, more, maybe more specific to PhD students uh, than master's students, but um, it's important to know. And of course, I would suggest go to the visit days. This one is for you. Uh, if, if visit days... Um, uh, are organized, and I, I hope they are in many universities where you get offers from, this is your chance to go and get to know the place. And even if you're not extremely excited about the place, going gives an opportunity to that place to persuade you why it is a good place for you. Um, and also gives you an opportunity to see whether the place that you really wanted to go to truly is on the inside um, how you thought it was uh, looking at it from the outside. Um, there are a couple of questions, but I will answer them in, in a uh, mo moment. Um, so once you make your decision, remember to, you know, kindly, well, either accept, obviously, but more importantly, decline the offer. Some universities have wait lists. And if you decline, there's another student who will get an opportunity to, to do graduate school. That is very important. Um, and of course, you know, if you're, if you're talking to mentors across different universities, uh, make sure that they know about your decision uh, because they have obviously invested some time in, in talking to you. And, and it's, it's, you know, um, a good way to acknowledge that. And it is a good way to, again, keep building that kind of relationship. Um, just to decline it, we assist them, again, shows that, that you're not necessarily interested in, in building that relationship with your potential future colleague. Oops. 
All right. So that's that's you know what uh, what we have for the the um, uh, letters and for what to do after you are after you get your offers. I just want to quickly go through some of these uh, questions and answer them, and then uh, just uh, tell you a little bit about the next steps after we're done with with the workshop. So we have a question here. Um, um, Does it help? Um, uh, who do you acknowledge to potential advisors? Uh, I, I assume that this question is about um, uh, who will you tell that you are maybe declining an offer. And that, if that's the case, usually what happens is when you get an offer, you will get uh, emails from specific people, from the program uh, 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 coordinators, from uh, the chairs of the graduate admission committees, uh, in cases of PhDs, maybe specific faculty who would like to reach out to you and, and uh, you know, say that they are also interested in working with you. All of those are the people that you have an opportunity to then later on email back and tell them uh, about your decision, whether you're accepting it or whether you're declining it. Uh, and even in the case of a master's program, there's going to be, uh, you know, a, the chair of the, of the committee will, will reach out to you uh, in, in, a, in a letter or an email. This is how you can respond back to, to them directly and not just use the system to say no. Um, um, our are visit days likely to be virtual in the next few years? It is difficult to say. Uh, we are navigating these challenges uh, and we're trying to uh, sort of do what is best given uh, all of the risks. Um, if the travel restrictions, uh, if uh, event restrictions remain in place, then it's very, very obvious that uh, we will have to have these events virtually which makes it a lot more challenging. And I'm really sorry uh, for that because these, these in-person visit days are fairly important in making decisions. And then, um, this is not a question. Um, so, so yeah, so um, with this, I, I think we, we're done with the, um, with the workshop. Um, actually, uh, I will just uh, stop sharing for a brief moment um, and, bring back uh, the other presentation. Okay. Just to show you where we are, we are at the end of the workshop. Um, I really want to thank you all once again for taking part. It is challenging to take part in these virtual workshops. Um, I understand that uh, there's a lot of material uh, and it's difficult to follow it through these kinds of virtual means through Zoom. Um, we all get tired after spending, you know, X num um, number of hours. Uh, so in many ways we had to cut down some of the content, but I'm hoping that the content that you did uh, get today help you, uh, not just, you know, uh, in terms of learning more about the Michigan, but in general um, about the way you think about graduate school, uh, what programs you, uh, you're you considering and, and how you will apply. Um, in the next uh, few days, we will send you a couple of more emails um, one of them also with a um, survey about the event. It would really, really help us if you were to respond because the feedback that you provide us help us uh, improve this event. And this year it's exceptionally important for us so that we can better understand how these kinds of virtual events work. What are the challenges and what are the things that we can actually do to improve uh, for future years. Now, of course, we hope that we will be able to go back to our original physical format, but it's difficult uh, to, to say. Um, so again, uh, thank you all. I will stick around for a little bit more, uh, just if you have any specific questions, but I will just like to echo um, some of the other comments, both from faculty panels, from uh, student panels, 
uh, feel free to reach out to us with, with any kind of questions that you might have, whether they're questions specific to the faculty, whether they're questions specific to the students. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Reaching out to your peers, to your uh, potential future colleagues, that is the source uh, where you can learn about the experiences that are particularly relevant to you. So, so do reach out to them. Um, and uh, we hope to uh, see your application at the University of Michigan. And also we hope uh, to have an opportunity to work with you in the future uh, as, as colleagues, as graduate students, um, and, um, and even later on. So thank you all again for taking part and, and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Um, hey, Dr. Nicole. Yes, hello. Uh, may I have a, a quick question, probably more about the recommender. recommender. Of course. Uh, so, I mean, let me get my video sound. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> Good so, um, I have, uh, right now I'm working on the operating system and system uh, system level research. But before that, I have done some research, uh, particularly in the machine learning, but in a very applied way uh, with another ECE professor. Uh, I'm wondering, I mean, definitely that like letter will, will help, but I'm wondering how, like, how strong will it help like, in comparison, it, given the condi condition that I will be applying for the system area. Um. I think that this is, uh, these, these are very close areas. Um, uh, even even in, uh, if you're applying, let's say, with a political science degree and you're applying to CSE, I, I still would encourage you to apply because that is not something that will just disqualify you uh, and especially would not make uh, your uh, recommender letter any less relevant. At the end of the day, what they're doing is they're comment your recommenders. They're commenting on your uh, uh, current uh, uh, performance uh, and your ability, the kind of foundation that you established uh, uh, to be a successful PhD or a master's uh, student. Uh, if they're able, and in your case, if they're able to comment on the methods that you applied, uh, at the end of the day, these are these could be scientific methods, these could be um, uh, engineering methods, this could be design methods, any kind of methods. If, if they're able to show that, that you're able to learn a method, that you're able to apply it, that you're able to um, uh, reflect back on uh, how the results of that method um, uh, relate to the hypothesis that you started off or any kind of uh, uh, idea that you started off. It already shows a lot about uh, uh, what you have uh, learned so far. So, so it's definitely not a disadvantage. You don't have to, it's, it's, it, it, it almost sounds like, well, if I don't have the PhD in the area that I'm applying the PhD for, what, what are my chances? That, that's not necessarily how it works. We're, we're more looking at um, sort of how have you uh, dealt with the, the challenges that were placed before you, uh, rather than do you already know how to do what uh, what we are admitting you to learn how to do. Okay, gosh, thank you so much. Thank you so oh, much. My pleasure. Yep. Uh, thank you for the answer. See of you. Of course. Bye. Now, I know it may be challenging to um, just, uh, you know, ask a question right now, even in comments or by unmuting yourself, but that's why I invite you to send us any of your questions via email um, through the uh, email that, that uh, you use to communicate with us, uh, the email that we use to uh, send um, 
the information relevant to the workshop to you. Uh, and then if uh, I am able to answer, uh, I would be more than happy to do that. And if it requires me to route it to someone who can answer it for you, uh, we will do that as well. Um, so even if you don't get a chance to ask a question right now, or if you didn't get a chance to ask a question during the workshop, uh, we, we are here to, to try and help. Uh, I have a question, Dr. Banovich. Go ahead. Um, so I know you. Uh, I know you spoke. Uh, you uh, you made it very clear that the statement of purpose is more important than the um, the personal statement. Uh, and I thank you for going over some examples with us. Um, but I don't really have a lot of insight as to what a good a uh, personal statement looks like. Do you have any recommendations or places where uh, you can recommend where we can search for good examples? Uh, that is that is a very good point. And part of the reason probably here is because uh, personal statement is very, very personal. It is very much uh, uh, an opportunity for you to tell your own story in a way that you would like to tell that story. And maybe that's part of the reason why you know, we are not, um, you know, providing you with, with templates. Uh, actually, even, even for statement of purpose, I would say avoid uh, templates, but still understand what is important uh, to note in your, in your statement. And as long as you are following a sort of um, uh, a format of, of an essay that is presenting an argument, you will be fine. Uh, and in many ways, your, your personal statement is presenting an argument, uh, but it's more uh, about uh, who you are as a person and how uh, your uh, uh, experiences shaped uh, not just who you are, but your decisions to apply to school. So it's very, very difficult to, to provide um, relevant examples uh, that, that, that will somehow relate directly to you. Um, but again, you know, if, if you really, really need to see um, some examples, I would suggest uh, reaching out to uh, students at universities where you're applying uh, in uh, areas where you're applying uh, and ask them perhaps for, for their own um, personal statements, uh, because they will also be able to, uh, if, you, if you have a chance to talk to them, they will be able to clarify why they wrote their personal statements the way the way they did. And they will be able to reflect on what they think was, was good and what, what wasn't so good. So that's my best suggestion. All right, thank you. That very much uh, helps. My pleasure. Um, sorry, I couldn't hear you past that. Uh, did you have another question or? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was debating a little bit whether to ask it or not, but I guess I can ask anyway uh, the personal statement. I know you gave some good examples about what to do, like, you know, a lot of people coming from uh, from first generation into college or like, uh, I think one person in this, um, uh, uh, during this program mentioned her being a victim of some crime uh, like that. Um, uh, so I am none of uh, I am none of these. I have a uh, I've lived a pretty, I guess you can say good uh, 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 good. Uh, I had a pretty good you know upbringing plus college. Really no financial hardships, any of that sort. Um, how can I still write a good uh, personal statement out of like a boring I guess you can say situation? Um, so, uh, before I answer that, uh, somebody did point to Berkeley's uh, personal statement. Uh, it seems like they uh, provide some more tips there and maybe even, I don't know if they have examples or not. Um, but I, again, uh, you know, it's, it's about uh, going back and looking at uh, your own personal experiences uh, and, and trying to better understand your own motivations. Uh, why you have decided to, um, to pursue graduate school. And, and at the end of the day, uh, what are your personal goals uh, after you uh, get your degree, after you get your master's degree, after you get your PhD degree? Those also uh, have a lot to say uh, about who you are as, as, a, as a person. Um, so 
Um, so so that, that's probably the best I can, I can answer without necessarily knowing your, your personal situation, right? So, so try to reflect more on, uh, you know, what, where, where, where did you start and, and where are you hoping to, to be once you get your degree? All right, thank you. That was very informative. You're welcome. Hi, uh, I had a question. Of course. Uh, I am an undergraduate student and uh, from where I am, the school year is not very certain because of COVID. So I am expected to graduate by 2021, but I might not do that. Uh, should I get... Uh, an offer for a PhD program, can I ask for a deferral and how do I go about that? That is a very good question. And um, I am not necessarily in a position to, to make you any promises or give you any sort of certain answers. And I, and I hope you understand because this really comes down to the universities where you're going to be applying and whether they are going to um, have uh, special considerations. Um, and even then, even if they have some, or if they don't have any special considerations now, they might come up with them in, in a month. Uh, the, the part of the reason is because we, we are all still learning uh, about the situation that we are facing. We're still responding uh, to it. Very often, uh, the response is not uh, the best, uh, but uh, what we try to do is we do try to learn from it and, and improve. Uh, so it's very uncertain times, exceptionally uncertain times. So it's very, very difficult to answer your question. But uh, what I would suggest is to um, uh, send this particular questions to the um, graduate um, uh, admission staff, the, the email that, uh, or graduate, sorry, graduate program staff email that uh, we use to communicate with you uh, uh, with your question. And then we'll try to uh, uh, get you in touch with the people who know more about it. And in particular, the graduate admissions chairs and the graduate uh, admissions uh, or graduate program coordinators who might know more. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, there is a, um, uh, a comment that says, I thought an undergraduate degree is the key uh, a prerequisite for all PG and master's programs. From what I've heard, you usually send an application six to nine months before you uh, start. Uh, so just to clarify, a lot of undergraduate students will be applying to graduate school while still uh, in their undergraduate program. And sometimes things happen. Uh, it doesn't have to be COVID related. And at those times, um, uh, I would always recommend that the, the, the students who face those kinds of uh, special circumstances reach out to the graduate program uh, coordinators at the universities where they were admitted or where they got offers from uh, to tell them about these, uh, these special, um, special circumstances. Uh, and Sonia, it looks like, um, uh, so Sonia also posted some um, some more clarification about uh, maybe maybe even in response to that question. Um, um, there is a, a question that was asked privately, although it does seem like it, it I could potentially ask it to uh, uh, sorry I could potentially answer it, but uh, please uh, I still uh, would like to to have your permission uh, in the chat if you could. Uh, tell me that, that you're fine uh, me answering this, this question uh, 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 public. Um, right, and that's actually the last question that we, that we have. Uh, but again, you know, please feel free to unmute yourself uh, and ask your question directly. Or, I'm sorry, I mean, you can give me a permission to talk about this publicly in chat. But if you have, if somebody else has other questions, please feel free to either post them in chat or unmute yourself and ask.
Um, all right, so I think uh, this was a response that granted me the permission. Um, will there be recordings of the workshop sent out for us to refer back to? Yes, uh, part of the reason why we recorded the, the workshop is so that we can, um, uh, that we can edit it and uh, uh, make it available uh, to uh, those who participated today and, and hopefully even um, uh, more publicly uh, to others who did not get a chance to uh, participate uh, for whatever reason. And we will try to inform you of that um, as well when it, when it is available. Um, can you please send the link used for EGS application fee waivers? I missed it in the uh, I missed it the first time. Yes, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, so basically it is on the uh, admissions page, uh, but we will uh, I'll I'll try to take notes to uh, to send this to you uh, specifically. So we will send you an email with some of these links, and then we'll try to specifically call out the um, the link that we talked about. You're welcome. Um, we have another private message. So again, um, I would have to um, ask for permission to, to discuss this publicly or to read it and answer it publicly. Uh, please let me know in the, in the chat if that is okay. In the meantime, Sonia just shared the fee waiver link and we will send this link to you in an email as well. Um, all right, so I just got the permission to, um, uh, to answer this question. So the question says, I'm currently working in industry for over three years from all the material required for applications. I feel the program is not inclined to someone who is already working, just a feeling, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I think, uh, uh, so you, first of all, having worked in the industry for, for such a long period of time, uh, you have over de already demonstrated additional experience that uh, uh, perhaps prepared you so much better for any graduate school uh, than if you were, you know, simply, you know, just out of undergrad without any experience other than just courses. Um, and uh, if, I, if I can, you know, I, I would also like to, to share a personal story. I am someone who quit uh, my undergraduate degree in the middle um, and uh, started a company with a, with a friend and then came back after many years um, uh, to do my undergrad, um, not even to, 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 to do uh, graduate school. And, and, I, and I only think that, that perhaps that is something that, that enriched my experience, not uh, disqualified me from uh, from uh, these programs. So I, I would actually say uh, uh, leverage that um, and, and talk about uh, uh, how that experience strengthened your foundation. Now I do understand that, that maybe some of the things that we talked about um, in terms of recommendation letters uh, are maybe a little bit more difficult um, uh, to come by uh, because uh, you're thinking, well, these faculty, they don't remember me. Um, and, and, and that's, that's in many ways sort of a special, uh, uh, special consideration that uh, any graduate admissions committee will, will have because they will understand that, hey, you know, your recommenders are people who are, who are talking about your, your recent experience. Um, and and usually, usually it is not a problem. I have never seen someone with extensive industry experience uh, uh, that be used, uh, you know, 
or, or that be somehow um, a disqualifying um, uh, circumstance. Um, does it help to submit a PhD application any earlier than the deadline or are all applications read after the, uh, no, it will not necessarily, I am not aware of any advantage um, because um, the, the graduate admissions committee does not look at these applications until all of them are in. Um, and it might actually take a little bit of time after they're all in um, uh, because uh, maybe some of the you know recommendation letters are still coming in. Maybe uh, they need to request some additional documents from from students. Uh, they might have to address some 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 issues. Um, so no, I, I do not think. I, I hope that that is not uh, not a case for for any admissions committee uh, unless uh, they specifically tell you you know there there are two deadlines and. You know, the first deadline is what, what you should submit uh, at, and then, you know, the second deadline is to, to you know, um, uh, fill, uh, fill spots that we haven't filled in the first, uh, in the first uh, deadline. Pay attention to that, but usually, I, I've never heard, this, at least I can say in University of Michigan, it is not the case. It will not give you advantage or it will not disadvantage you if you apply earlier. Oh, sorry. I, I just read the, the whole question at, at the end. It says that you may answer this publicly. Thank you. So um, uh, the question is, I'm planning to transfer programs from a master's at one university to a PhD at, uh, I assume, another, uh, maybe even Michigan. How would I fill out the section where it asks degree expected or date degree expected if I anticipate switching out of the program? You may answer this publicly. Um, this is this is a very uh, special case, uh, and I would suggest um, uh, reaching out uh, to the um, uh, graduate uh, program uh, coordinators uh, with this question. They will know more. Um, my understanding here is that you have a case where you have a, where you attended a master's, but you will not complete that master's degree. Uh, and that, that if that is the case, you, you would have to somehow specify that. Um, but um, uh, Sonia, I don't know if, if maybe uh, you have uh, an answer to this right away, or if this is something that we should uh, try and answer at, uh, at a different time. I think it probably would be best to send an email to CSE grad staff and we can answer it over the email. Yeah, that makes sense. So, uh, whoever posted this, please, uh, please do that, and we'll, we'll try our best to to give you the answer through email. And uh, uh, the, there's another message privately uh, that says, uh, "Convey my thanks to Sonia as well." You're welcome. Well, you are definitely most welcome. Any other questions? Either in chat or feel free to unmute yourself as well. Sonia just shared uh, the email address where you can send your inquiries. Okay, well, uh, I'll wait for another, say, one minute uh, in case you have any questions. And if um, other questions come up at any point, again, please feel free to email us. Uh, and we will do our best to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, well, I wanna thank you all once again for taking part in the workshop and uh, I wish you uh, 
wonderful rest of your uh, weekend. We look forward to uh, seeing your application at the University of Michigan and, you know, hope that we'll have an opportunity to work together again.